So happy Father's Day. Um, I'm Gordon, I'll be leading the first part of the service, and Ivor here will be talking to us later. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we pray you'll be with us this morning in all that we do. We pray for the music, for the prayers, for family time, for the preaching. Be with us here, and be with all the churches in this country and around the world as we worship you. Amen. Now, okay, right, we can all now sing together, so if you uh, would like to... If you can stand, we're going to say, who breaks the power? Subjects of um, 
Jesus is right because we can trust him. This is from the, Revelation 21. This is the reign of King Jesus. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. The old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. <coughs> everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water, without cost from the spring of water with life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this. I will be their God, and they will be, their, be, be my children. That's the sort of reign. So quite what the, what, what the crowns will, will do, what it will mean, but it will be a great reign. That's what we've got to look, to look forward to. Whatever the problems in this life now, we've got that to look forward to in the future. And, uh,
Revelation chapter 22, the first few verses. And he showed me a pure water, pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign for ever and ever. Father God, we come before you now in worship and praise. We adore you, for you are our great and mighty God, and we look forward to that time when one day we will be in heaven and serving you. Forgive us when we get things wrong, for wrong attitudes, for wrong words. Lord, may we do what you want us to do. And Lord, as we come before you today, our rock and our redeemer, well, whom else can we turn to in times of need and suffering? We want to mourn with those who mourn. And we live before you, especially Dawn, Brenda, Rainey, Gordon, Jonathan and Andrew, and also Jean, in their loss at this time. We pray, please comfort and uplift them. May they know your everlasting arms, arms around them at this sad time. Lord, you alone are our strength and help in time of trouble, and you draw close to those who suffer. We ask too for other family members who are close to our hearts, we ask that you would speak to them and draw them to yourself. We pray for our pastor, Ivor, in all his responsibilities, and for Carol as she supports him. We ask for your provision of a new pastor and that our church may know your guidance and leading at this time. We pray for our young people that they would grow up to be strong in their faith and we pray for all those who teach them. Lord, we pray too for our nation, for those who serve in many different ways, teachers, doctors and those ministering the gospel throughout the United Kingdom. We pray that young people will be able to hear the gospel in schools. We pray for our government at this time when we think especially about the rail strike and we pray if possible it could be averted. We give thanks for our Queen and her faith in you and we pray that her example would help many to consider the gospel seriously. We thank you for peace in our land and we remember the suffering of those fighting in Ukraine. We pray for your help for all those who suffer there, for those parted from loved ones, and especially for those mourning the loss of family and friends. And we pray for peace to be established in that land, as well as elsewhere where there is war. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem and for your people in that land. We pray too for our missionaries, wherever they are. We think of the Lot family, please provide the housing they need. We pray for Amy in the East. Lord, we think of our own church members, of those who may be frail or unwell, and ask that you be with them and strengthen them in their faith. And we pray for one another, that we might follow your word, which urges us to help wherever we can in the place you have put us. In your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen.
in Philadelphia. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have a little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Philadelphia, what do you think of when you hear the word Philadelphia? Brotherly love. Brotherly love. Here's one after prayer, guys. The word means brotherly love and um, we've been continuing our journey round these churches and we've come to Philadelphia. Philadelphia was called brotherly love because the um, emperor at the time uh, had an interesting relationship with his brother. And uh, the emperor who was there uh, found that uh, his, his name was Attalus II, um, <clears throat> but he had a special devotion to his brother Eumenes II. You don't need to remember these names, by the way, no. uh, because I don't, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm able to read them. But the two of them actually ruled together. And then Eumenes was in a battle um, and uh, he, he disappeared and it was thought he had died. And so uh, Attalus actually married his widow and became king of Pergamon. But then uh, Eumenes appeared and instead of there being a, a wrestling match, a battle for the throne, Attalus stepped down and annulled the marriage and Eumenes reigned along with his um, wife. Then eventually he died and Attalus married her again. So that's just a, a little bit of background to the city uh, which is um, about 30 miles southeast of uh, the last city we were in, which was which was Sardis, 30 miles southeast Philadelphia. It stood in a wine producing area uh, and it was founded with this name, Brotherly Love, to promote a, a, a spirit of unity, customs and loyalty within the realm. And um, that's what it was. It was the gateway to Central East Asia Minor. Um, anybody know what the modern name of Philadelphia is? No, neither did I. Al Acer uh, in Turkey. But of course, there's a Philadelphia somewhere else, isn't there? In the States. There, there may be a lot of Philadelphias. Where else is there? In the U.S., yes, in the U.S., thank you. 
But what we uh, normally do here is we look at, and, and by this stage, when we've got to the seventh, uh, sorry, the sixth of these churches, you may be uh, having echoes of, of what came before. Uh, but here we look at the description of uh, the angel of Jesus. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true. And how much we need holiness and truth today, don't we? We find a great dearth of that within our society. But these are the words of him who is holy, holy and true and holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. And you'll have got used, those of you who have been following this, to the fact that that description picks up some words in Revelation 1. Revelation 1.18 uh, says this, that description of the Lord Jesus I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. That commendation, I hold the keys of life and death. <coughs> but that phrase that is there, what he opens no one can shut and what he shuts no one can open, is something the Apostle Paul found in his ministry several times twice in corinthians and once in colossians he said this uh, in first corinthians 16 verse 9 because a great door for effective work has opened to me and yet there are many who oppose me and paul talked about the door opening for him <coughs> in the next letter second letter to corinthians uh, chapter 2 verse 12 he says now when i went to troas to preach the gospel of Christ and find the Lord had opened the door for me. That was Paul's experience. And then in Colossians 4 verse 3 he says this. Pray for us too that God may open a door for our message. So that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. In Jane's prayer she talked about the gospel. The gospel probably her most frequent word in her prayer and the gospel just means good news and friends it is good news it is good news the fact that Jesus came lived on this earth grew up just like a, a, a man but went to the cross and died for our sins he was buried and the third day he rose again from the dead and that is good news paul himself says if christ be not raised we are most miserable but he is raised and he's seated seated today at god's right hand and i think <coughs> we will see that even is not the end of the story as we unpack this i wonder about us i wonder about us personally and us as a church, as we look at those words, that he opens a door that no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. We've had a privilege uh, in this in this town of Baltry. I keep wanting to call it a village, but it's a town. I know Osterfield is a village, but um, we we keep having opportunities, an open door to speak the words of truth, to speak the gospel message into people's lives. I wonder as a church, do we take that? We've had opportunities over the last couple of weeks, over the Jubilee weekend, we were uh, down at the celebration on Market Hill. Yesterday at the sports day, we were flying the flag again, if you like, and we had lots of conversations and big thank you to those who turned up and helped uh, Chrissy during that during the day but we had an opportunity to talk to people and say this is what we do we meet we we have these activities for all the family and we're delighted when people respond and it's not responding to us but it's responding to the prompting of God's Holy Spirit and we're delighted when that happens 
But do we take advantage of the open door that we have in this country? Let's pray that we will continue to use that while we have it, because it may not always be the case. Three points I want to just uh, quickly look at in this, and there are three Ps this week. The praise, verse 8. The promises, verses 9 to 12. And their perseverance, verse 11b and 13. First of all, the praise. This is one of the churches that didn't have any condemnation. They weren't condemned for what they had done. But they were given praise. And here we see the praise in verse 8. I know your deeds. Does that remind you of anything? We had it with Sardis. I know your deeds. Here we have it again. I know your deeds. You see, God knows what we do. He sees what we're up to. We may want to hide from him, but God sees. I know your deeds. See, I place before you an open door that no one can shut. Verse 8, picking up that, the keys again. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. A couple of quick things there. Uh, little strength, they probably were a small group of people. And uh, Jen was praying that we would find uh, a new pastor for us, because I'm due to stand down from this role uh, in a couple of months' time. And our prayer is that God will bring to us somebody who can pastor this church and help us to look out and, and see the needs that there are. And some people have said to me, maybe we can't get somebody because we're such a small church. Don't believe that. If God has a plan and purpose for our church here, and I believe he does, he will bring the right person to lead us forward. And we'll all be involved. You see, this church had little strength. Yet, you've kept my word. And have not denied my name. In those verses, and I'll refer to them later, I hope I remember to do that from uh, Revelation 22 that Jane read. It talked about the name. What did it say? It said, um, sorry, I just, just missed where it is at the moment. Um, yes, verse 4. And they will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads. And that comes up again in this letter the name of God, the unique name of God. The praise that they had, I know your deeds. Secondly, the promises. And uh, there are actually six promises here. And um, when somebody was looking at my PowerPoint earlier, they thought, well, this is going to be very long. I said, well, I just want to touch on them briefly as we go through. Because I think, you know, when we, when we come together at church and we <coughs> explore God's word together, that's not an end of the matter. Gordon has already said on Wednesdays we'll pick up some of these things and look at them again. But you know, you have, and if you don't have, speak to me and I'll make sure you have a copy of God's Word that you can look at. Uh, you may have it this way or you may have it electronically on your phone. Let me give a plug again for Lectio 365, a little app that you can get that will help you to focus on part of God's Word every day. But here, uh, we have got promises, and there are six promises in this passage. Let's go through them quickly. The first one is in verse 8, and uh, it says, sorry, verse 9, isn't it? Yeah, verse 9. Um, confusing myself here. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, what a phrase that is, synagogue of Satan, uh, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. Wow, those are strong words, aren't they? I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. First promise to this small group of believers in this church in Philadelphia, where they, they lived in a place that talked about brotherly love. 
where they were, were supportive of each other and yet the first words there are talking about people who claim to be Jews but are not but are liars you see love doesn't mean that we're wishy-washy love doesn't mean that we can uh, cover up things sometimes and the Bible talks about speaking the truth in love and here the angel is saying this and the promise that they have when they're facing these people who are lying to them who are claiming to be Jews but are not the promise that that the angel gives is that their opponents will acknowledge in due course will acknowledge their faith in Christ first promise second promise in verse 10 and in verse 10 it says this since you have kept my command to endure patiently I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth one, one commentator said that's probably the most difficult verse in looking at end times and what's going to happen at the end of the age because as we'll see in a moment the story doesn't finish with Christ going up to be with his father in heaven and a big word that's sometimes used here is tribulation and I'm not going to get into tribulation today and when it happens and, and so on all I want to say with this verse 10 is for these Christians it says here I think very clearly they will not face the trials and testing of the rest of the world now some people interpret that as no Christians will some people say we will go through a time of trial and testing and there are disagreements between Christians and between theologians as to which view should prevail but I'm taking this at face value. These Christians, certainly it says here, will not face trials and testing uh, of the rest of the world. I don't know when those trials and testings will come. But the next bit, I do know the third promise, is he says, I'm coming soon. And people say, well, how soon is soon? Because, hold on a minute, we've got, um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a few years since these words were written. And yet he's coming soon. And he is coming soon. And Peter talked about this <coughs> in Second Peter. Let me read you <coughs> the, the third chapter of Second Peter. In my Bible is headed, the day of the Lord is coming. Because Jesus going up to be with the Father isn't the end of the story. Because he's coming back. Next week we'll be celebrating communion together. We'll be sharing the bread and the wine. And one of the things that Jesus said when he instituted this was he said, Do this in remembrance of me. You can shout it out. Till I come. It's not the end of the story. We haven't got to the end of the story. But uh, Peter who wrote uh, his letters much closer to um, uh, this, this time, was saying this in, in verse 8. Um, sorry, verse 5, let me do. Um, he's talking about people who say, where is this promise? You know, this, this, this promise that Jesus is coming again. And, and Peter says, they deliberately forget that God made the heavens and the world by his command, and he brought the earth out from water and surrounded it with water then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood by the same world where the present heavens and earth were being stored up for fire they are kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will perish that doesn't sound like good news but the good news is that Jesus came and died rose again went to be with his father and is coming back and verse 8 says this but you must not forget this one thing dear friends a day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years like a day and then verse 9 says this the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise 
as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That, friends, is the good news. He doesn't want to condemn people to uh, eternity separated from him. But there are conditions, and the condition is that we accept that Jesus' death was necessary for us. That we put our trust in the Lord Jesus. That the cross has meaning for each one of us. And then, of course, the resurrection. So that's the third promise. And you know what? I believe that absolutely and utterly. I have no doubt that Jesus is coming back. I don't know what's going to happen in between. I don't know where the trials, the testings will be. I don't know if I'll be alive for that, if any of us will be, or we've got to go through that tribulation. And there are debates and discussions about that. But I don't know any Christian who denies that Jesus is coming back again. And it says here, I'm coming soon. Fourth uh, promise is in verse 12, and there, the, next, the next three are all in verse 12. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Do you want to be a pillar? Do you want to stand upright? It doesn't sound a, a, a terribly attractive thing, but the thing about the pillars, and, and Philadelphia, I didn't tell you earlier, was subject to earthquakes. And within uh, the city of Philadelphia, they had uh, temples, and sometimes names were put on the pillars of, of special people who wanted to be commemorated. If you go to, I don't know, Gordon, whether you went to Westminster Abbey when you were down in London, or uh, whatever, you'll see lots of plaques there uh, commemorating various people. Some of them will be on the pillars, some of them are on the floor, some of the the, the, the various tombs that are there uh, and, and people's um, uh, remains are buried. But here, it's not just I will make a pillar in the temple in Philadelphia, but he says he will make them pillars in the spiritual temple of God in the new Jerusalem. Apparently, when Solomon built the temple back in the Old Testament, uh, he had a worker from uh, uh, a worker of brass from Tyre constructed two massive pillars in the temple. One of the pillars was called uh, Solomon called it Jachin, which means establish, establish. The other pillar was called Boaz, meaning strength. And there you've got a sort of picture of what the victorious people in Philadelphia were going to experience. He was going to establish them. He was going to give them strength, not just here on earth where they were, but in the spiritual Jerusalem. They were, Solomon was saying when he built the temple that, that this is a place of security, a place of power. And the same, it's the same thing as saying to these Christians, this little group of Christians in Philadelphia, that they will occupy sure, secure, firmly established positions of strength and power. And that's brought out in the fifth um, promise, which is again in verse 12, if we read on, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, never again will they leave it. Friends, we're on a journey. Some of us are near the beginning of the journey. Some of us are further along in the journey. Some of us may be at that door and not quite sure what to do next. But we're all on a journey. And that journey will have its ups and downs. It will have its, its challenges and its victories. There will be times when you will want to sing to the highest heaven because of what God has done. There will be other times when you'll be struggling. And Jane again prayed for some of our uh, fellowship here who are facing the death 
of loved ones. Others who are facing uncertainty because of sickness, because maybe of financial insecurity and the, all the pressures that come. One little example of, uh, of this occurred with me last week. I was at a, uh, at a training event and we lost some papers. They weren't essential papers, but they were lost. And we were hunting around for them and I said, I know I left them here. They're not there now. And we, we hunted around. And then somebody came into the room and said this. Let's pray about this. I just love this. And so Nicola led us in prayer and said, Lord, help us to find these papers tonight before we go to bed so we can sleep easily. And one of our number went to a bag that somebody had. And she had already looked through this bag, but she looked through it again, and there she found the papers. And I'm sure in your experience in your life that has happened. But never again will they leave it. This security, this uh, the, the, the pillar in the temple of my God, they will be forever secure. And that's something that we can cling on to through the good times and through the difficult times. And then um, the sixth promise is again in verse 12. He says this, I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Right, an easy question for you. How many times is name mentioned in what I just read? Out? Three times. And name is, is very important. We, we, we could do a whole series on names. My name is engraved on the palms of your hand. Lots of, lots of references. And, and so it was great to have this read out by, by Jen at the beginning of her prayer. From Revelation 22, 4. They will see his face and his name will be written on their foreheads. You see, names are about identity, aren't they? We had a message this morning from a friend saying... Please pray for our, one of our grandchildren who is ill with, uh, what was it? Pneumonia. And my first question was, which one and what's his name? I haven't found that out yet, but I will do. And when somebody meets me or shares with me, or with any of you, what do you often do? You ask them their name. Because that gives an identity to people. And what do you often do next? You forget it. Don't you? One, one little tip on that is, if somebody tells you their name, use it straight away. And that will help it to register in your mind. I'm not great on that. And one of the things I used to do is I, I would write it on the palm of my hand. And I did that once with somebody and uh, she got very upset because she thought I was noting it down so that I could report her for something. <laughs> <laughs> she can't win. But names are important and we connect with each other with names. And do you remember uh, in one of our previous uh, churches, what was the name written on? What, what, uh, what? It was back in Pergamum, if you want to, to, to glance back. What was it? In Pergamum, I will give to each one a white stone, and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. So you can get excited about names. Um, well, maybe. Um, <coughs> but. It's all about our identity, their identity, and I would put it to you, our identity will be with God 
word name used three times the name of my God the name of the city and my new name and remember those white stones there's a conference last week somebody had a stone that they picked up from a visit to Laodicea I was tempted to ask him could I borrow that because we'll be looking at Laodicea next week but uh, I didn't but I've got some pictures that I'll show you uh, next week so their promises those six promises that uh, their opponents will uh, will eventually acknowledge their faith that these Christians will not face the trials and testings of the rest of the world that the Lord will come soon that he will make them pillars in the spiritual temple of God they will be forever secure and their identity is going to be with God and finally their perseverance it's the verse that uh, Gordon <coughs> read to us 11b um, he says I'm coming soon hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown and then that final verse which I haven't always focused on but let me just do it as we come to a close now whoever has ears let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches and that's a reminder for us friends that this is not just for them then it's for us now remember what the Spirit says to the churches hear what the Spirit says to the churches if you have ears to hear the praise the promises and their perseverance so today we're going to sing it is well with my soul what is your relationship with God is it do you have a testimony not something that happened to you years ago or even last week but what God is doing with you now as you move forward with him
so that we will find the truth of what we've sung that this my sin is nailed to the cross and we bear it no more so that we can sing that we're looking forward to your coming back again because that is certain whenever the time is help us to be ready for that and take the message of this good news to those with whom we come in contact who need to hear it and respond by your spirit in Jesus name